you don't know me, I'm Jim Weissong. I'm the uh, Dean of Math and Science here, and I've been in school for Human College for 31 years. 25 of those I was a faculty member, and among other things I taught uh, astronomy. Including in every one of my soon, astronomy courses, I was a unit on history of logic and space flight. Because I used to take and had a physical prop, I don't have the book to show you, but I would hold up the astronomy book, and I would say, do you know what this would be like without the contributions made by the findings that came in through our uh, efforts in, in space exploration. It wouldn't be a book, it would be a pamphlet. And we'd be done with this class in a week. We've learned so much, we, we have gone so far. Those of us who grew up with it, um, and, and I grew up in Kissimmee, uh, we could watch the rockets take off. We would go over a lot of times to see them go. People that we knew worked at the space program. My high school physics teacher, Mr. Tom Wells, was a launch engineer. I thought everybody's high school physics teacher worked for NASA at some point in time. <laughs> we had a, uh, a lot of interest and excitement in the space program in that, that time period. And I had fears that over time we were losing interest. And I'm so excited to see how many people are still interested. But from a historical standpoint, we're going to talk a little bit, uh, quite a bit about history today, but also uh, for what it holds for the future and, and the promise it holds uh, moving forward. So that's kind of a setting the stage for it, and as I said, I'm thrilled. We had to make the move from 119 because uh, when we first put this thing together, I thought, well, you know, we'll have maybe, uh, talking to, to my sister, Dean Dan Camacho, I said, we'll have maybe 15 people. We might have 20. We should fit comfortably in 119. And the RSVPs kept coming in. I said, yeah, we might have a good problem. And so uh, I said, I, I have a good place to go. I also would tell you that uh, a little plug for our science seminar series for many years now. We have a, a science seminar series that during our main terms we run with all kinds of different topics and speakers. And I would send that out to the HCC. Uh, email distribution. So keep an eye on that because we try to, to, to do this sort of thing uh, and, and bring people in and, and have a little bit of something for everybody. So I think most people are probably here or on their way and we'll have to get started because um, I want to be respectful of your time. Our program today and how we're going to, to do it is I'm going to kind of give an overview of history of Rockford and Space Life going way back when, uh, back more than a thousand years, and then very quickly move forward to take a look at really about the last 60 or so years of that uh, time period where so much has happened. And then even take a little peek ahead. So we're going to kind of cover that. And then, uh, then Mr. Wells is going to uh, speak with us about some things that he was an eyewitness to, worked personally with, and I think that you'll uh, appreciate uh, his insights. And, and throughout that time, if you have questions, it's an open dialogue, so just jump in. Uh, the way you might forget the question. And so we'll talk a little bit about uh, what he saw being there literally uh, in, in the, he's in the picture. We'll, we'll, we'll point him out. Uh, in fact, I've had some fun these last few days sharing with him things that I found that, I, that he hadn't seen himself either ever or not in 50 years, including a, a video clip of him shaking hands with President Nixon. And yeah, it was, an, it was an interesting time. How many of you were alive and remember the Apollo 11 launch. Yeah. And uh, it was really something. It's one of those things you never forget. Is it? Yeah. Well, let's take a look without further ado and, and kind of go through and see what we, what got us to where we are today. Um, George, can you see if you can bring the lights down a little bit? So we just... I don't pretend to know which one of those switches is the best one to hit. Yeah, you can take all the pictures you want. You just send the royalties, JY song. Gotcha. 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 Can everybody see that screen? Yeah. Well, we're going to go all the way back to China. How about that? To Wan Hu and his space vehicle. Wan Hu? Wan Hu. Wan Hu. You know, I want you to look at a couple things in this. Look at the moon. There's the moon. The moon is going to the object of fascination. We're, I, he was, I think, maybe, I don't know if he was wanting to go to the moon. I, I'll kind of give you a spoiler. He didn't make it. <laughs> um, Wan Hu, uh, you know, the Chinese developed black powder, and black powder led to rockets, and the Chinese used these rockets for a number of purposes. 
uh, a long time ago. It wasn't very long ago. I mean, it wasn't very long ago before they got the idea that maybe if the, the rockets could be harnessed, that they could lift somebody up into the air with them. And according to historical documents, uh, Wan Hu had constructed a celestial chair uh, to be powered into the heavens uh, with uh, rockets strapped to it. There's different reports about how many, but let's just say that no matter which r report you read, there were a lot of rockets. <laughs> These rockets used black powder. Black powder is an explosive, of course. And uh, all rockets are basically a controlled explosion with key emphasis on control. And you're trying to fly on that explosion into the heavens. Sometimes it works better uh, than others, and that is still the case today. It did not work out so well for Juan Hill. According to the reports, when they lit the fuse for all of these rockets that were tied together, there was a tremendous roar, huge amount of smoke. And if you've ever seen black powder, you know it does make a lot of smoke. And, and uh, various reports that the roar became an, an explosion or it, it was deafening no matter what. But when it was all over and done with, there was nothing that they, there was nothing, nothing to be seen. I don't think they ever found one. They didn't find the one, the who, or any part of him anywhere. He was gone. So I don't know. My suspicion is he didn't make it to the moon. But um, somebody has to go and try it first. I think it's interesting, though, that, that, that people have been wanting to try it and they've been wanting to go. When we sing the national anthem, everybody knows the words, the rockets, red glare. By the time of War of 1812, rockets had come back into the picture again. Not much different, though, in some ways, from the rockets the Chinese used to repulse the Mongols. They were basically giant bottle rockets. Except now, they were made with metal bodies, mass-produced. Uh, they had different kinds of warheads. Sir William Congreve, working with the British, built these rockets. And volleys of these Congreve rockets were used to uh, attack uh, different targets during the war. Those targets would be, oh yeah, our assets, right? Because this William Congreve was British. So when you hear about the rockets red glare, bombs bursting in air. These rockets that were being launched against Baltimore's Fort McHenry from the rocket sloop Erebus were British rockets. And when they would take off, they'd light the sky. Francis Scott Key was uh, held prisoner on a, on a ship in the harbor. And with every volley of rockets, he could see if the flag over Fort McHenry was still there. And of course, it made it till uh, the dawn's early light. Now, rockets, interestingly enough, looked like they were going somewhere, literally and figuratively, during that time period. But then something happened. This is what happens in technology. Uh, a new breakthrough eclipse rockets. Uh, cannons existed during this time, but they had limits to the range that were made of cast iron and bronze. Developments in steel making and other metallurgy technology made much bigger guns much more practical. And they kind of put the rocket out of business for a while. In a weird sort of way, it also set the stage for them coming back. And we'll tie that together in a minute. There's always people that dream before the people that come along and do. Sometimes the dreamers are the doers, sometimes they aren't. And these are three people who I think are very instrumental in the history of rock and space flight. How many of you have you even uh, heard these names? Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. I always used to say a poorly paid Russian school teacher, but that's you know a redundancy, right? <laughs> whether you're Russian or not. So. Um, a math professor, underappreciated, right, Alex? <laughs> Konstantin Tsiolkovsky in, in Russia uh, prior to the revolution and then after the revolution, uh, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky dreamed of spaceflight. And he used the principles of physics and mathematical calculations to show it was possible, even if the technology wasn't available at the time. Here's three key things that he came up with, and keep these in mind. He said that for a rocket to fly into space, it makes no sense to carry all the, the mass with you that you no longer need. Dropping off parts of the rocket after they no longer are important would be part of, of, of any successful strategy. So the concept of staging rockets, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky saw that uh, all those years ago. He also understood that for optimum performance, you needed to find a very, very good fuel. And that while solid fuel, in the form of black powder and other things, 
had been all that rockets had ever used up to that time, he said liquid fuel would be the way to go. Not only because you could throttle and control an engine and use liquid fuel, but you could get higher performance. He even went so far as to speculate on what the highest performance fuel combination would be. He said a bipropellant combination using liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen would give you the kind of power you would need to fly into space. And he said this at the beginning of the 20th century. Now here's what was so absurd about that. It was correct, yes, but what was so absurd was at that time oxygen had only been liquefied in teaspoon full quantities. Hydrogen, while it was believed theoretically possible to liquefy, had not been liquefied yet. And we're going to hear uh, firsthand from somebody who worked on these advanced engines. Uh, you want to give us a hint, uh, Tom? What was the uh, what was the J2 burning? Liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. What's the space shuttle main engines burn? The same engines that were used on the SLS? Liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. This guy saw the future before it could be made real. He already knew what it was going to what it was going to look like. The other thing is he worked out all the orbital dynamics and he worked out how to control a rocket in space. Because in the absence of, of air, ailerons and rudders and elevators used for an airplane don't work. Reaction controls were needed, and the ability to use Newtonian physics to figure out how to change the direction, how to pitch and yaw and roll the spacecraft. He worked it all out. Again, my math colleague in the audience would say, ah, oh, it's pretty simple vector diagrams and trigonometric functions, right? <laughs> Let's jump to Robert Goddard, 1926, his Aunt Effie's farm in Worcester, Massachusetts. The neighbors uh, actually got the constable to go out and have a talk with him after <laughs> what he did that day. He was a professor uh, at Clark University, and uh, he'd been working on different ideas about how to build a liquid fuel rocket because he knew about the work of Tsiolkovsky. He had written Tsiolkovsky. They overlapped in time. He said, yeah, I think we can build this kind of an engine. And he built this thing that looked like, uh, well, some people thought he was actually making a spill and he was just using this as a cover. He built this thing, it was rickety, it was pipes, it had uh, the, the rocket engine on top and the fuel tanks on the bottom. And in 1926, he lit it off on the San Anthony's farm. It took off, and the distance that it flew up into the air before reaching its highest point and then falling back to Earth would, would not have cleared the launch tower <laughs> that the Saturn V rocket used. But it was the first liquid-fueled rocket flight, and the Saturn V's engines and all the liquid fuel engines that followed used the same basic design. Oh, and by the way, that claim was successfully prosecuted by attorneys on Goddard's behalf when his widow and estate sued for patent rights and infringement for all of the uh, designs of his that were used without uh, any credit given. Um, now, there's an interesting connection with Goddard in history. There was a published report of this, almost a joke report, something along the lines of crazy professor, as in the redundancy some people would say too. Uh, they promote the craziest ones, you know that. Right? <laughs> crazy professor builds a rocket ship at his aunt's farm. Claims this is the way to go to the moon. They started to, to uh, actually tease him about being, they called him Moon Man Goddard. And it was not a very flattering thing. It was, it was <laughs> very tease. A historical figure, a historical figure, read an account in the news, newspaper and said, and took it seriously. I mean, this was like a Florida man story, you know, it was meant to be a joke. <laughs> but a young fellow who had just become famous for something he did, read about it. His name was Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh was very interested in aviation. He had just made history in 1927, the very next year, a few months later actually, um, in the spring, uh, by flying across the Atlantic. He had a lot of fame. He was thinking about the future of aviation. And he knew that someday planes might fly so high they might need an engine that didn't need air to burn. That's how far he was thinking ahead. Charles Lindbergh 
uh, contacted Robert Nutter, who at first thought it was a gag and that somebody was actually just teasing him because it was a lot of people were joking after the story was published. And he said, all oh, right, this is a very famous person. And you get a letter from him and say, yeah. He thought it was one of his colleagues down the hall. But Limburg continued to, to follow up. And ultimately, Goddard was convinced it really was Charles Lindbergh. Long story short, Charles Lindbergh flew his plane to Worcester, Massachusetts, and picked up Robert Goddard, who'd never been in an airplane before. Flew him to Washington, D.C., and had him introduced to people at the Smithsonian and the Guggenheim Foundation, who then funded his efforts. He moved to White Sands, New Mexico, and for the rest of his life, continued to build larger and larger rockets and work out the principles of rocket flight. Those were the things that he worked out the, the patent issues he settled over. Herman Oberth in Germany was working on his doctorate. <clears throat> his major professor, his committee chair, ultimately rejected his work and said, this is wonderful work, but I'm going to reject it and can't grant you a degree. <laughs> Some of us have been there. <laughs> he got a great job, uh, but he said, why? Because astronautics is not an acceptable field of study. Now, his professor did say, this, however, needs to be published as a book, not as a dissertation that goes on the shelf, because this is something that's going to be a, a roadmap for the future. So the dissertation that was not accepted, he did ultimately get his doctorate. But that dissertation was published as the English translation of the German title, The Rocket into Interplanetary Space. And it became literally the blueprint that inspired a lot of people to think seriously about rockets and spaceflight. He also was in touch with Zinkowski and in touch with Goddard and became a member of the BFR, the German Rocket Club. And there he is, right there, in over. And this young fellow who was 19 years old, a young, young man by the name of Werner von Braun. And he was extremely excited and extremely bright. By the way, how many of you have a younger brother? A younger brother in here? You are a younger brother. My son, Austin. I mean, I can tell you, as an older brother, we do these kinds of things. Um, he used to tell the story that when he was growing up, that he made his brother Magnus sit on a garbage can and threw a cherry bomb underneath and would blow him up into the sky. <laughs> and that he had dreams of space flight. He didn't think he'd make the trip. He put somebody else on it. <laughs> I remember metal garbage cans and cherry bombs. And that's all I can say. <laughs> this group was making rockets that they launched in Berlin, they gave exhibitions, people were interested, and a particular individual by the name of Walter Dornberg was interested. He came dressed in some clothes, was very interested. He actually was an operative for the German military. Remember the cannons we left hanging a minute ago? Well, after World War I, Germany was prohibited by the Treaty of Versailles from having any large artillery. Uh, because, oh yeah, in World War I, they had artillery that could fire a 2,000 pound projectile the distance from here to Orlando. So they kind of wanted to keep big guns out of their hands. But the treaty did not speak to rockets. And while Germany was rearming within the boundaries of the treaty, and they were still weak, they saw rockets as a loophole. And so they recruited Werner Braun Braun, who at that time, I think, had just turned 20, to become the head of the German rocket program. That wasn't much. It was him, a couple technicians. I think they had a secretary to keep the books. They were trying a lot of different things. Uh, that one kind of went somewhere. It ultimately ended up in the development of this rocket, uh, which is the first modern ballistic missile, and first flew in uh, 1943, I believe, a V-2 rocket. It had the ability to take a 2,000-pound projectile. That, that seems to be a number very really alike. One-ton projectile could carry 200 miles. Left the atmosphere, flew 3,500 miles an hour, and it re-entered, it was unstoppable. The V-1 buzz bomb could be shot down. It was a cruise missile the fastest Allied fighters and the early jets the British employees could catch it and shoot it down on top of it, really, flip it over. But this, unstoppable, by the time the rocket hit and exploded, well, you knew it didn't kill you. Because the people that had gotten it never knew it was coming. Hundreds of them were launched on London, on Antwerp, and other targets. 
when the war ended, we captured many of these rockets, but more importantly, we captured most of the rocket scientists. In reality, they voluntarily surrendered to us because they figured they'd get a better deal working under us than the Russians. They were right about that. Some did go to work for the Russians, and the Russians got the rocket factory. So we got some rockets and the scientists and the blueprints. They got some scientists and the rocket factory. And both of us started out pretty much with the same, from the same starting point. That is a V2 right there, but it's, it's at light sands. We brought these before the war had ended in the Pacific. We brought German scientists under Operation Paperclip, set them up at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas, and they began launching rockets in the summer of 45. But some of Welsh, before we came over here today, one of the stories that Von Braun liked to tell was about one of the rockets that had a malfunction. Instead of turning north on the White Sands Range, its engine vane stuck when the gyro failed and it made a hard turn to the south, heading right for El Paso. How many of you been to El Paso? Just across the river is Juarez. It barely cleared El Paso. It landed in Juarez. It landed in a graveyard. Didn't kill anybody that wasn't already dead. The Mexicans didn't think it was so funny. The Germans got a big boot out. They said, we're the only German task force that from our base west of the Mississippi attacked Mexico with a ballistic missile. <laughs> the U.S. government didn't think it was very funny either and said, these rockets are getting too big. We need to find a new place to launch them. They found that place when the war ended. All the surplus bases were being looked at for realignment or being turned back over to, uh, to the municipalities. For instance, Drew Field was turned over to the city of Tampa. And a quarter of a mile from here we now know is what? Tampa International Airport. Yeah. Uh, Henderson Field, also an air base in Tampa, was turned over to the city of Tampa, and we now know it as what? Adventure Island. Yeah. Bush Gardens, Adventure Island, the brewery up there, all that sits on a mobile air base. There was a piece of uh, surplus real estate on the east coast of Florida. It's called the Canaveral Air Force Station. They said, this is perfect. It sticks out in the water. Nobody lives there. Rattlesnakes and, you know, hermit crabs and rockets blow up and they kill anybody. With fire in the southeast, we can put a station or two down the coast of Florida, put some in the Bahamas, and track the rockets as they go down and crash into the Atlantic. For 1,800 miles, you could track them. And so that's how they set up the, uh, the test range, and that's how they set up the uh, facilities that ultimately became the space center we know today. First launch was of a V-2, 1950. Did they retrieve those rockets? Yeah, they crashed into the water. Some of them are out there. There's actually some sites that are known divers can go to, but most of that water is really, really deep. That's the Army's Redstone rocket. And really what it is is a modified, enlarged, souped-up V-2. The Russians had the same kind of experience. They were building on that same technology. So both of our military ICBMs and IRBMs, intermediate-range ballistic missiles, kind of started out with that. This fellow was not known by name until after he died. When he was alive, he was only known as the chief designer outside of Russia of the Soviet Union, Sergei Korolev. As a young man, he had read the rocket into interplanetary space. He'd read uh, Roman Ober's book, and he had a club in Russia that was building rockets as well. He went to work, uh, after a little time in the Gulag, uh, he went to work uh, working for the Soviet military, uh, building rockets, and after the war, uh, he became the head of their ballistic missile program. He built a rocket, ultimately his team, uh, called the R-7. Uh, most of our engineers and scientists call it old number seven. If it looks familiar from about here down, it's because it's the same rocket today we know as the Soyuz. The Russians, they just keep tuning up, building on the same design. We had man-rated multiple rockets. The Redstone rocket, the Atlas, the Gemini two versions of the Saturn, the space shuttle. And we're working on additional ones now to be man-rated. The <coughs> Russians have man-rated one basic rocket design. In 1957, October 4th, the Soviets launched a satellite in space. It wasn't a surprise. It shouldn't have been, at least, if it turned out to be. They had been saying they were going to do it, but we didn't believe they were up to the task. We thought it was just more propaganda. And then when they launched it, and it had a transmitter sending out a signal so you could verify it, they don't take our word for it, they said, 
A ham radio could pick it up. It was a polished sphere to pick up enough light that if it was just before dawn or right after sunset, you could see it in the sky. It tore people out. There's a Russian moon overhead. It's beeping. What does that beeping mean? It turns out nothing. It's just a beeper. But when people are scared, they can imagine things. It did scare the military. Here's why it scared the military. They didn't care that there was a Russian satellite flying around. They couldn't care less. Here's what scared them. To put a satellite in space, the speed that achieved orbit is about 17,500 miles an hour. If you have a rocket big enough to have Delta V and accelerate something into space so it can make an orbit, by the way, following Tsiolkovsky's calculations, then it's well big enough to launch a weapon, a nuclear bomb, that could leave the Soviet territory and be on top of New York City or Washington or Tampa in under half an hour and would be just like the V-2, unstoppable. So the military planners said, we couldn't care less about Sputnik. What we care about is they obviously had the ability to have an operational ballistic missile. And since we knew they had the bomb since 49, oh yeah, they got both pieces of the puzzle. And we were behind. Our rockets weren't as big. They didn't need to be, though, in one sense. Our nuclear weapons had more bang for the pound. But that put us behind in the space program. We'll see in just a minute. <coughs> We tried to launch a satellite in 1957 as well. It was called the Vanguard. Our approach was to launch a rocket that was a modified weather research rocket, the Viking rocket. We were going to play this up as a peaceful rocket. We're not doing a war rocket. It was a peaceful rocket. <laughs> the peaceful rocket got about that high off of the pad, shuddered, fell back down, and, uh, and exploded. Uh, as you can see in this picture. In fact, the top is coming off even before it. So, now, the satellite itself actually transmitted a, a signal from the flames. How pathetic. Khrushchev, who we'll see in a minute, the classic Russian villain, the, 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 the prototype for the Bond villains, Khrushchev had just a wonderful time. He went, oh, 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 oh. our satellite orbits the world. America's grapefruit burns on the launch pad. <laughs> it, was, it was horrible, crushing blow. Von Braun had been working on a rocket that could put us in space. We could have been in space with his rocket in 56. Military planner said, do not have an accident and get that thing into insertion. There was some suspicion he might put propellant in the top stage, and had he done so, it would have orbited uh, during one of the tests of the Juno slash Redstone in 56. Uh, after this failure, they said, yeah, yeah, you better call Von Braun. Uh, January 31st, 1958, uh, the Jupiter C, which was really a Juno rocket, we had a lot of uh, you know intrigue with names and things in those days. Uh, it took off at night. It launched from Cape Canaveral um, and it headed out over the Atlantic Ocean. They lost the tracking on it as it went over the horizon. And they knew that if it made it into orbit, <clears throat> that in about 75 minutes, they'd pick it up at the Goldstone Dish in California. And so they waited um, for an hour, more than an hour, about an hour and 15 minutes of the waiting. And, uh, the word came in that they got a call on the phone and two words or three words, no words. Goldstone has the bird. We had a satellite number. And around it came. Now, this was propaganda, but it was also legitimate. Our satellite didn't just have a beeper. The Explorer 1 had some instruments. It also had a revolutionary new technology called solar cells. And uh, Explorer 1 actually picked up something that turned out to be an important discovery. If you're a young scientist, <clears throat> you're the guy that gets to do the stuff that the older guys are afraid they're going to get embarrassed by if something goes wrong. How many of you remember that commercial? Let Mikey eat it. Remember that cereal commercial? <laughs> Ooh, I don't know. So a young fellow by the name of James Van Allen was given the job of being the, the, uh, one of the instrument and, and payload designers for this Explorer satellite. He worked at the University of Iowa. Uh, because a lot of the older guys said, ah, oh, we're not dealing with Buck Rogers and, uh, you know. 
Well, James Van Allen has his name attached to the largest geophysical feature of planet Earth, the Van Allen radiation belts. Yeah. Oh, he break. Well, guess who's back? There's Herman Ober. There's his, there's his student, Werner von Braun. And that's the core of the Redstone team. He was really an advisor and mentor, but von Braun's team uh, built the missile that got Explorer 1 up. We're going to see they did some other things here as well. Uh-oh, there's Khrushchev. Ha, ha, ha. Here we get Garen. In April, April 12th, 1961. Yuri again. See the rocket? Look familiar? Hole number seven. Yuri Gagarin takes off from the former Soviet Union, flies all the way around the world, and comes back down. We didn't know until years later that in reality he did not land in the capsule. They weren't entirely confident of the retro rocket at the last minute stopping it, even with parachutes. So at about 3,000 feet, he jumped out of his own parachute. Russian beef farmers tending their crops with animals saw this thing streak in and heard the sonic boom. Then they see a parachute. He was wearing this bulbous suit with this giant white helmet, CCCP on it. And he comes down the lens. They went at him with pitchforks. <laughs> and, he's, and he told them. I'm a countryman, I'm a comrade, look, look. And then they wondered, what kind of plane was that? He said, it wasn't a plane. He goes, I, he had been around the world. I've been around the world in 90 minutes. And they said, he must have hit its head. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't believe it. Think though about what that says. Here they were with animal drawn implements, without even a radio but also put them in space. Ultimately, that's one of the things that caused the collapse of the Soviet Union was those kind of gaps. <clears throat> well, what were we going to do? Well, we had a manned space program, too. By 1959, we had established the Mercury program. But we had a problem. Remember, the problem was our rockets went up to the task of lifting large weights because they'd been made for small <coughs> nuclear bombs. <clears throat> this look familiar? That's the Redstone again. New paint job, different name. Some tweaks. Von Braun's design. Basically a generation 2 V2 missile. The engine of this rocket didn't have the amount of thrust that the escape rocket would have pulled the capsule off of the Saturn V in an emergency. They lifted Alan Shepard in that capsule. There he is. They lifted him up 115 miles into space. It took him downrange and he landed off the Bahamas. It was a 15 minute flight. Khrushchev made a point of it. Tell me about that. He goes, oh, cosmonaut. Flies around the world in 90 minutes. America's astronaut takes a flea jump to the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is we couldn't get a uh, spacecraft into orbit for, for a year. Uh, we followed this with another uh, suborbital flight, Gus Grissom's flight. Uh, Gus Grissom's flight, if you saw the right stuff or know a little bit about history, <clears throat> there was a premature opening of explosive firing of the capsule hatch, and it filled the water. And while they were trying to save the capsule from sinking, he's over there saying, I'm drowning. They almost lost it. <laughs> Sadly, we later did. And in a weird irony, it had to do with the hatch again. <clears throat> Alan Shepard took off from the Canaveral Air Force Station. How many of you have been on a cruise out of Port Canaveral? Okay. The cruise terminal is right over here. That's Jetty Park. I spent a lot of time at Jetty Park going up. It's a great place to go. That's the jetty right here. Cocoa Beach down here. So we can stand over here and watch the rockets take off. We got a man in space finally in orbit. We got a man in orbit. His name is John Glenn. He orbited in 1962, in February took off on an Atlas missile. That was a more powerful ballistic missile we had. And John Glenn, well, he became a national hero. So much so they were afraid to risk him. And he knew he would not get another flight assignment. He left the astronaut corps and had a very successful career in politics. 
as a senator from Ohio and a presidential candidate. But then an interesting thing happened. They gave him a chance to fly again. And in 1998, he flew as a crew member on the space shuttle, the space shuttle Discovery. 1998, and he set another record. He was the first astronaut to orbit. And to this day, he's the oldest man ever to fly in space. And when the flight surgeons gave him this examination, they said, you know, John Glenn, you're in pretty good shape for a 35-year-old man. <laughs> and he said, I'm, I'm sorry, um, I am getting a little hard of hearing from the propeller noise flying planes all those years. I'm not, I'm not uh, 35. He says, I'm better than twice 35. He said, I know you are. He says, any 35-year-old man wishes he was in the business shape as you. These guys were selective. You know the right stuff. Why the name of that movie was selected. These, were, these original astronauts, were, they were really something. Now, here's an interesting HCC connection to that. And it's an interesting HCC personal connection. In 1998, when John Glenn flew on the space shuttle, HCC had a payload on the space shuttle. How many people know that we had a payload on the space shuttle? Alex. Alex, the moving company. Way back when, do you remember? It was our aquaculture program. Our aquaculture program had a payload on the space shuttle. And as the head of the science department, that area fell under my overview. And as a mission specialist, all the experiments have to be parsed out. And guess who had the responsibility for tending to our payload on the space shuttle? John Glenn. So John Glenn was tending to our payload, which was under the oversight of the science department, which I was in charge of. So effectively, John Glenn was working for me on the... <laughs> what an incredible thing. It was an incredible thing for a lot of reasons. I remember we got to go over. We had VIP access to the to the Cape. We watched the the, the the launch from the VIP area. But then I found out something really cool. And I'm sure Tom knows about this from being an insider at NASA. They had after parties for rocket launches. Oh man, they got carving station at prime rib and shrimp and everything. Yeah. And I got to meet some astronauts. And I got to meet a guy named Max Max Viget, who is the designer of several of our rockets, including. Uh, the Mercury capsule and the space shuttle. And the amazing thing is here's real astronauts and here's the designer of two of our space programs and nobody's talking to them. There were actors that were invited to this party and including some from the Star Trek movies and everybody's wanting to talk to the actors. I'm always talking to the real astronauts. I learned some good things. And, and Max Max Fajay, he's passed on now. But did you ever read Max? He was a, 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 a rather diminutive Cajun guy. And man, I'll tell you, he could put a lot of rocket fuel down the hatch. <laughs> Very interesting. Of course, that's how you get the best stories, too. We choose to go to the moon and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. John Kennedy gave two speeches that were the ones that you see often parsed and clipped and melded together. The famous one at Rice University, which is the one on the left here, and he gave a speech before a joint session of Congress where he laid out the specifics. Now, let's go back in time to what had happened. Kennedy had come into office as a young and vibrant president, the first president born in this century. That would be the 20th century. Uh, that was a slight to Eisenhower, who was seen as, as, as being up in years, <clears throat> and he vowed to make changes, but almost immediately became embarrassed by things like the fact the Russians were beating us in space. And then there was, oh yeah, the Bay of Pigs. And he needed to do something to refocus the attention on our progress and see it being down the road, something, a big goal we could achieve, get the attention off of the short-term failures that were likely to continue. His engineer said, we're not going to match the Russians real soon, but we got some stuff that is in the works that can really pull off some big stuff, some big tasks. So he decided on this goal, this goal of, the, of landing a man on the moon before the decade was out. And of course, the other part of that, returning him safely, safely to the Earth, right? Uh, because his engineers said, yeah, we got the things in development already that could probably make that happen. It, it would at least be a fair race, a fair shot. In the meantime, he even admitted in his speech 
he admitted that the Soviets would continue to do things in the meantime that would attempt to embarrass us. But we had a bigger goal, and that was the starting point. There he is with von Braun, and an early version of what would become the Saturn rocket. You don't go from a one-man spacecraft to a moon ship in a single step. So there were stepping stones along the way. We took another one of our missiles, the Titan missile, and used it to put a two-man spacecraft into space. And it was designed to do several things. It was designed to prove that we could stay in space a long time. How many of you either own or ridden in a small sports car like a Miata or something like that? And I have a couple of Miatas and an RX-7. They're pretty tight. You know, as time went by, I swear they got, they got smaller. <laughs> Imagine sitting, even with somebody you like, in one of those for two weeks. In the same underwear. Speaking out of two. We won't talk about anything else. <laughs> One of the duration flights that Jim and I did, that's exactly what happened. For two weeks they had to sit up there just to see if they could survive for that long. They rendezvous with another one and docked, both with a target vehicle then with another Gemini spacecraft. They got out and walked in space, not just to say they did it, but because extravehicular activity and making a spacesuit that could survive the elements of uh, the vacuum of space was important. It proved the technologies needed to go to the moon. <clears throat> and that rocket, that was a very interesting rocket. It used a nasty fuel combination unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, it smelled like fish, and red fuming nitric acid. Very nasty, a lot of power. The astronauts that flew it and later flew on the Saturn said the Saturn had a lot of rumble and roll, but this thing kicked you in the butt on tape up. It also had ejection seats. Racing to the moon. If you're gonna go to the moon, you got to go big, or you don't go at all. In the time that Jim and I was flying, we built one of the largest buildings on Earth. That building was big enough, originally called the Vertical Assembly, assembly Building, and later the Vehicle Assembly Building, but VAV works for either one. It had these giant garage doors that could open up big enough to take the Saturn V rocket, which was 363 feet tall, plus its service structure, which was even taller, the building was more than 500 feet tall. Don was telling me earlier this morning, he actually had to go up on top of it. So you can just about see, you can see that Orlando. The rocket came out on one of the largest vehicles ever made, a giant crawler, two of them were built. They still use them. They'll be used for some of the rocks we'll see here in a little bit. And it would go uh, three miles out to the launch pad at about a half a mile an hour. But when you got a rocket that weighs seven and a half million pounds, you know, it's not, that's not bad for one. The Russians, they were in the race, there was no doubt. It could have gone either way. Sergei Korolev built a giant N1. The N1 rocket was huge. It had actually more thrust in its first stage at liftoff than the Saturn V. But it wasn't as efficient. It couldn't get as big of a capsule to the moon. But they had a similar plan. And if they would have pulled it off, their capsule that would, or their lander that would have gone down to the moon would have carried only one cosmonaut. They didn't have the, the payload capacity to put a two-man ship on there. Why did we win and why did they lose? Anybody have an answer? 13 times this rocket launched. 13 times they said go and 13 times it went. The worst it ever suffered was a couple of engines in the second stage had cracked out and it still made it. And that was during a test flight. Six times they tried to launch the N1 and never did it work. And it didn't work because of something that today would not be a problem. It didn't work because they were trying to uh, coordinate too many rocket engines. What my son said was right, it had too many engines in the, in the stage that with electromechanical controls and early digital controls, they couldn't be they, they, they couldn't be controlled in a manner that would prevent problems uh, that, that would cause the, the rocket to become uh, unstable. Today, Elon Musk with the with the Falcon Heavy has solved that. He's got the dream. 
If it would have worked a little bit better, they might have gotten there first. So it was a real race. Along the way, there was a tragedy. There's Gus Grissom and Ed White, Roger Chafee. Gus Grissom, our second man to fly in space, nearly drowned in the capsule hatch blew prematurely, you might recall. Ed White, he was the guy we saw here just a minute ago. That's Ed White right there. He's our first man to walk in space. Roger Chafee was the youngest astronaut assigned to a flight at that point in time. They were about two, three weeks from launching the Apollo 1, the first manned Apollo. Uh, it would have been an Earth orbital flight to test the capsule. They were in doing a routine check. They were having some problems with communications. Gus Grissom even said something. <clears throat> but I kind of paraphrased the other day in a comment I made to our OIP department because we were having problems with learning phones. He said, how are we going to get to the moon, fellows, if we can't even talk among two or three buildings at the Cape? <laughs> They smelled something, it was kind of an odd odor, um, and then there was a fire in the cockpit. They hired, they, they called out, we have a fire in the cockpit, there's a fire in here, get us out. And that was that, the communications were cut. They got there, the cab crew was there in minutes, they couldn't get the cabin door open, the astronauts died. I mean, without looking, nobody looked. Tell me, which way does the door open? Back here in the back of this auditorium? By code, it opens out. Because there's a fire in here, you want to push that door and get out of here now. The door on the Apollo capsule opened in. The irony is Gus Grissom almost died in his first space flight because the door blew prematurely. He did die on this one because they couldn't get the door open in time to get out. We fixed that. We fixed a lot of other things. These men didn't die in vain. It wasn't just something to make people feel good. They shook down that Apollo capsule. They slowed down the process a little bit. They found other bugs. And that almost certainly made our lunar landing program successful. That's the rocket that did it. The largest rocket, the most powerful rocket, the biggest rocket that has ever flown successfully and become operational to this day. It's never been a rocket as big, as powerful, as capable as the Saturn V. It was technology of the 60s, and the technology, as we're going to hear, is still some of that technology state-of-the-art today. It was incredible. Rocketdyne, the company that Tom worked for, Rocketdyne developed these engines, the F1s, the biggest rocket engines of their time. They burned kerosene and liquid oxygen. They were tremendous engines, huge. You go to the Space Center, you can see them. The, the engine belt is bigger than I am tall. Five of those engines on the first stage. That first stage was done pretty quick. Then the second stage kicked in. It used a more powerful combination. Constantine Theokostomy's recipe. Liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, the S2 stage, five engines, J2 engines. This is what Tom Rawls sat at the console and monitored. These were the engines that used that high performance combination to move this thing up almost to orbit. This just got it going. That got it up to literally Fitting distance, as my granddaddy used to say, of outer space. 16,000 miles an hour, just almost the delta V to put it into orbit. Then the S3 stage kicks in. One J2 engine, that takes them on into orbit. These engines have the ability to be restarted. This engine would put them into orbit. It would also be used for the translunar injection. That would be when, after a parking orbit, they were ready to light it up and head out. Head out to the moon. Then that stage was dropped. Another one of Siakowski's recommendations, recommendations, you might call. IBM built that. That was the computers. There's the landing craft. And that, way at the top, was the capsule. That's the only thing that was going to come back. That little spike on top was the escape rocket. If something bad went down, this had the explosive potential of a small nuclear, tactical nuclear weapon. You need to get off of it in a hurry. And that's what would pull the capsule away. That's the Saturn V. That's what took us to the moon. That technology was built and developed much of it from scratch in 10 years, less than 10 years. That's the accomplishment that you have to really thank the people like Don Wells and the generation of engineers for pulling off. Why does it take so long to do things today? Well, one is we don't put the money behind it and we don't put the urgency behind it. The other is, we've become a lot more risk adverse. A lot of this stuff was tested 
to a far less uh, degree of certainty than uh, what we do today. Um, but they did it. They made it happen. <clears throat> Tremendous capability. Spacecraft would take off from Earth, go once around, fire that engine up again for translator injection, head out to the moon, go around the moon, the capsule, its service module, the lunar lander, this stayed in orbit around the moon, and a landing craft with two of the astronauts transferred to it would go down and land on the moon. After they were done with the activity on the moon, only the top part of it would leave. The bottom half it has its own launch pad. If you go to the moon to launch a rocket, your own, to get back home, you get that your own launch pad with you. So when they launched to come back off the moon, one engine would take them back up. They asked, asked the astronauts, wow, you're sitting there thinking the only thing between me and getting home is that one engine, and if it doesn't light, it'd be there a long time. It had multiple systems and redundancies. It was hyperbolic. It didn't need igniters. When the fuel hit, boom, it lit. And it always worked. They all got back. But what kind of bravery did it take? Tom, you're there, aren't you? I'm there. Yeah? Let's see, you are right here. <laughs> That's the firing room. This is where the rockets launch. This is at the cave. This is where all the systems are checked as the rocket is prepared. This is where everything is checked when they're getting ready to, to launch. If you've heard that communications loop, when they go down the line and they call out guidance, communications, propulsions, go, go, go. When everything's go, and when the count gets to zero, and the rocket takes off, they're in control. And when the tail fins clear the top of the tower and they begin the roll program, they hand it off to Houston. Mission control takes over. But until then, it's all these folks' responsibilities. <coughs> the VIP area, some of the supervisors and so on, and Thompson tells more about this in a little bit. But this is the S2 control area, so the second stage control area. There's a follow-up heading to the moon. Did any of you go to the Cape that day? Who was over there? We were there. You were in the firing room, and I was seven miles away at the Bank Causeway watching. <laughs> I doubt a few other people. A few other people, me and about, well, the Florida Highway Patrol estimates that from Volusia County, you know, with Daytona and New Smyrna are, down to Gavar, down about to Jetty Park, I mean down to Sebastian Inlet. In that stretch, along A1A, along the coast, on the beaches, was estimated a million people. Now, what's amazing about that, Florida's population in those days was only about six million. Been a great day to be a burglar. You could have robbed everybody blind. There was nobody home that day. But the burglars were there, too. It was an incredible thing. I'll never forget it. That's why my folks took me there. I remember my dad saying, boys, we're going to be out in the summer. Boys, we're going to go over and watch the fellows leave for the moon. He says, you know what? He says, I don't know if anybody watched Columbus go out to sea. He says, but you're going to watch those guys head out. He says, it's going to be historic. And here it is. We're talking about it all these years later. And it was something. That rocket, if you had never heard this, Saturn was slower on climb out than the space shuttle. It would take and go. This thing was a slow climb out and an incredible roar. The ones we watched from home, in Kissimmee, 50 miles away or more. After the time for the sound to reach Kissimmee, like the way thunder was, some time after the actual rocket, we could see the rocket. You know, you can see it from here. Several minutes would go by, and then all of a sudden, oh, the patio doors that went out to our patio would start vibrating, and my mom's china in the hutch would vibrate. Closest thing to an earthquake we had in Florida. I'm not kidding. University of Florida Seismic Station in Gainesville would pick up Saturn launches. Here you were in Winter Park. You were rattled your China too. It was something. When they were going to the moon, everybody in Florida knew it. Werner von Braun watching his master work take off. President Johnson, who after his death would have mission control, the launch control, I mean the uh, Space flight control 
in Houston named from the Johnson Space Center. <laughs> Dignitaries, and see if I can find him. He is here somewhere. Uh, I can find him when I'm looking at the PowerPoint. He is back here somewhere. Right here. That bald head and that white hair right there? Hey, the fellow that had been kind of famous for some aviation exploits himself back in 1927. Charles Lindbergh was there as an invited guest of the astronauts. Think about that. How much progress we've made in that period of time. Incredible. And this is, again, the VIP, some of the VIP viewing stands at the Cape. Neil Armstrong, Mike Collins, Buzz Aldrin, they headed for the moon July 16, 1969. Fifty years ago today, they were almost mm -hmm. there. Tomorrow marks the day that they landed for the first time. I remember two things about that. Watching men on the moon, and it was the first time I'd ever gotten to stay up with my parents' permission after midnight. <laughs> Kids didn't stay up late back then. When Neil Armstrong passed away, Charlie Bolden, who was the administrator of NASA, said as long as their history books, Neil Armstrong will be included in them. 500 years, more than 500 years has passed since Columbus made his famous voyage. But we know the names of the ships, don't we? How much you want to bet in 500 years or 5,000 years? Not only will Neil's name be remembered, but people will know how he got to the moon. The most successful failure in history. We brought men back from something that should have been almost certainly a tragedy. NASA taught us a lot of things. The experience of the Apollo program wasn't just about success. Those of you that know this story, you know this is a meme. Right, Austin, your generation. Failure is not an option. It wasn't. The work of the creative engineers, the controllers, got these men back. Apollo 13 had an explosion. If you've ever seen this picture, it shows just how bad it was. It wasn't just a little, you know, something cracked out. They had a circuit breaker blue or something. It blew the, they had a cryo tank blow up the whole side of the command uh, monitor. And we got it back. Now here's an interesting thing. I've often said if aliens landed for real and was confirmed, that'd be the biggest thing in your lifetime for about what? Six months or a year or two or three? And after that people would say, oh, there's so damned aliens on the news again, I'm tired of seeing that. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. Of all the people that have TVs, there's never been a time that such a large percentage of televisions in the history of television that people watch a single event as they did the moon landing. There's a lot more TVs today. But as a percentage of how many there were. Yet, do you realize that just a few years after Apollo 11, as a nation, we lost interest to the point that the last three moon missions were canceled? And we switched and used some of that technology, some of that hardware, to make our first space station, Skylab, the last launch of the Saturn V, the Skylab launch. We also flew our Apollo spacecraft on a smaller version of the Saturn rocket, so small that it had to use what they call the milking stool to hold it up. You see, kind of a booster chair when you're a kid at the restaurant. Saturn 1B. That was the last time it ever flew. 1975. They went up and met up this other with this other spacecraft. Met up with these guys. And who these guys are? Russians. No, they were Soviets at that time. Yeah. In fact, this guy's pretty famous. It's Alexei Lenov. Alexei was the very first man to walk in space. They beat us on that one too. So Ed White, our first American. And, and they met up. Uh, they, they did that. It was as much a ceremony as anything else. Uh, but it was also an interesting thing. It, it said we should cooperate uh, in space. And we have. Uh, the International Space Station's two principal partners, the U.S. and Russia. And we also didn't entirely waste our money on developing the hardware for this. You see this docking adapter? 
the, the docking adapter that was built to dock the Apollo and the Soyuz spacecraft, which had their own proprietary designs, that docking adapter was later uh, resurrected, and the basic idea and its mechanisms were modified, but it was what we used to take and fly the space shuttle to the Mir space station. And uh, a version of it is used on the International Space Station to adapt the Soyuz spacecraft that, oh yeah, since 2011, have been our only way to get there. The only way our astronauts have been able to get to our International Space Station that we're a partner in is to fly on Soyuz spacecraft. That was the Russian moonship. That was their command module and, uh, and capsule. And oh yeah, launched on old number seven, the latest version of old number seven. Tortoise in the hair, some people would say. Space shuttle was our new way to space. First flight in 1981, John Young. Orlando's proud of John Young. John Young Parkway, Orlando. When I was a school kid, he came to our school. Astronauts came to school in those days and visited with people. Back to elementary. Tom knows where that is. He came and, and spoke to us. Now, granted, he didn't live or grew up just 18 months away. But what a cool thing. I made it again many years later. I said, I know you don't recognize me. <laughs> but we had a good conversation. But the interesting about this space shuttle was all alike. They only painted a tank on the first couple of flights, and they realized the waste weight. So the orange tank used to is just there as much. Space shuttle was an incredible spacecraft. It was an incredible vehicle because it could take off and come back and land like an aircraft the size of a DC-9 airliner. And we flew a lot of missions with it. But it had a compromise that was built into it. In order to get the support needed, they made it bigger and different than it was originally designed to accommodate military missions that ultimately never flew that many of. Uh, they used solid rocket boosters, which can't be throttled, but are very simple. Uh, they thought that the biggest problem was going to be SSME, these engines. These space shuttle main engines, they thought would be the real Achilles heel because they were the most powerful and still are incredibly efficient and powerful engines. And they thought this could be what might bring a shuttle down. And sadly, they, they were wrong. These never caused a catastrophic failure. They had a few pad aborts and an engine failure on takeoff. They were able to accommodate. Here was the problem. How many of you remember this? We have to remember the tragedies and the triumphs and remember the people that were involved. And we lost these astronauts. We had only lost the three men on the ground the test up to that point in time. The Russians had lost a few as well. Vladimir Komarov was lost in 67. And they lost three cosmonauts coming back from the space station mission. When the Challenger blew up, it really was a gut punch. But we came back from it and we thought we, we, thought we were back on our track. A lot of people realize there were issues. It's a, just, it's a dangerous business. Von Braun laid out a plan a long time before this. He said build a space shuttle. Build a space station using it and launch a Mars mission from it. He had a three-part plan. But we never put the money behind the whole plan. We built the shuttle and only at the end of its life did we build the station. And we still haven't pulled off a Mars mission. We lost another shuttle, our very first shuttle, flying in 2003 now, to Columbia on re-entry. And this really started the end of the shuttle program. This is what accelerated the retirement of the shuttle. The irony and the sad part of that irony is that it broke up in view of people in Texas where there was as much of an investment in space program in Texas is in Florida is our connection. The last flight, STS-135 in July of 2011. Austin and I watched that from fly to the beach. Space shuttle came back and they're now in museums. But we're going back to the future in many ways. SpaceX has a spacecraft called the Dragon that will be flying within a few months. Boeing has a spacecraft called the Starliner. Again, we'll be flying within a few months. Going back to capsules that are flying on, well, not in the case of SpaceX. It uses its boost rover, but an expendable rocket on the Boeing. Uh, capsules that have a, a very robust safety escape mechanism. 
in the event of problems. Uh, captions make a lot of sense. Not as sexy as a flying machine, but they're a safer way in many ways to get back to Earth. This was a design originally that NASA had commissioned, HL20, uh, HL I think is what it's called. A company called Sierra Nevada is developing it now. Sort of a mini space shuttle. It'll be flown unmanned. And of course, this looks like the Apollo capsule. It's kind of a direct descendant, except it's bigger, and it's designed for even greater and longer missions. It's the Orion, and the Orion is capable of taking us back to the moon and onto Mars or onto flights to asteroids. All of these are in development, and you'll see them flying the next, within the next year, two of them. The Orion is actually already been tested. And the sons of Saturn, well, here's the sons of Saturn. They take off in the same pad. This one is a real picture. It actually has already flown twice. You remember its first flight, it took Elon Musk's sports car and a mannequin out into space. He was like, I can't believe he sent $100,000 a sports car off in space. I said, $100,000? Do you know how much press he got from that? How much advertising he got from that? <laughs> that he's a genius. That's the Falcon Heavy. And it's recoverable. And this, this is the SLS. And the SLS, interestingly enough, is reusing engines that we have experience with. It's using SSM engines, Space Shuttle main engines. Tom has worked on as well. SLS in its Mars version may even be using the J2X, the modified version of the J2 engine that was in the S2 stage of Saturn. That's not because we're not creative enough to come up with new engines. It's we got it right so far, so long ago. Why reinvent the wheel or the rocket? When this takes off, it's going to shake the cake. <clears throat> this one's pretty loud. You probably felt it over living in Coco. Did you see the Falcon? The, I, I watched it from here at the Davis Island Yacht Club. I was in a meeting down there. We could see it really well. And we're going back to the moon, so that's the plan. By 2024, I wouldn't put money on that, but maybe I hope I'm wrong. But sometime soon, that's the plan. And it's probably going to happen one way or another because other countries, again, are engaging us in what is starting to feel like a race. And private industry is getting involved. Keep in mind, by the way, that's a, whoops, keep in mind, that's a privately funded space vehicle. That's a privately funded booster. And on to Mars. When I was a kid, I thought I'd see a Mars landing by the time I was a young person in college. Von Braun laid out a plan that would put us on Mars in the 80s. And even if it slipped by the 90s. And now I wonder if I'll live long enough to see it. The technology is within our grasp today to do it. Is the will? I don't know. So that's your generation, the younger of you, that's going to answer that question. I put this picture up here because Von Braun wrote this book in the 50s. Look at this ship. This is the design that Elon Musk is testing right now to go to Mars. Hey, you want to fly in space yourself? Let me ask this question. How many of you, if it didn't cost you anything, would want to go? How many of you pay, now keep in mind the younger of you that when you get older and make a little more money, that, you know, things change. But how many of you pay $20,000? People pay that on cruise on like really deluxe things. How many pay, how many people do you think would pay even a hundred thousand dollars? Now in this room, I don't know. That's that's you know, that's getting a little rich for this line. But there's people that spend that kind of money don't even blink. Then again, not in this room. But doing a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars is ticket price. And there's people already reserved and booked on both Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic and on uh, Bezos' Blue Origin. And you'll see these flights starting in the next year or so. <laughs> Suborbital flights, then orbital flights. It's a little longer than I thought it was going to take, but it's going to happen. I don't know how much I could get away with and stay married. <laughs> <laughs> I might find it out. All right, that's enough of me blabbering. Now it's time to talk with somebody who's there to see it from a lot closer up in the Bennett Causeway. And I want to introduce our guest, Mr. Tom Wells. Tom was graduate of MSU. I know some of you are, yeah, yeah, okay. He's <laughs> an old fan. And he was 
before that, I graduated from Osceola High School in Kissimmee, Florida. We both were. So I joked with my mom today on Facebook and said, we got a full house to come out and hear a couple of Kissimmee boys talk about us. Imagine that. Right off the with my As an engineer working for North American Aviation Rocket Island, he was a propulsion uh, engineer for the uh, J2, uh, S2, uh, the J2 engine, the S2 stage. And uh, we've got some pictures to kind of go along with this, but I'm going to invite uh, and, uh, Mr. Wells to come up and I'd like you all to give him a warm welcome and, and talk a little bit further about his involvement in the space program. So welcome to Tom Wells. <laughs> Tom was uh, in between the Apollo program ended at the shuttle beginning, he taught uh, his alma mater, and mine. And so there, we have a disagreement on the story, but it's just a minor one. I think it's a perspective. When I was uh, going into my senior year, he had a physics class. And it was kind of, wasn't entirely like by invitation, but people kind of got recruited into it or were, you know, the high school physics class. In those days, that was kind of, you know, a lot of people kind of said, oh, I don't know, physics. <laughs> well, even as a science guy in high school, I kind of said, oh, I don't know about physics. Oh, a couple of years my math happened. I was a science guy. I mean, math? Okay, you yeah, know, I'm the dean of math and science. <laughs> so I heard this word come down that, well, Mr. Wells wonders why he hadn't signed up for his class. You know, Mr. Wells, he wants to see it. You know, he, he can't understand why he hadn't signed up for his class. A lot of math and physics. <laughs> so I went and talked to him. He said, I wonder why you haven't signed up for my class. I said, there's a lot of math and physics. He said, there's only math and physics so we can do physics and do the fun stuff. But then he told me what he just repeated a little earlier today. Two semester class. He killed us in the first semester and if we survived, we did fun things in the second semester. Like go to the space center to see him at his launch mass. I survived. It was great. I said there was two kinds of seniors. Ones that die in the first semester and ones that die in the second semester. <laughs> so I said, if you die in the first semester, I'm going to bury you. But the second semester, we're going to have some fun. So I think, we, I think we did. We did a lot of things. And here we are, 50 years so, uh, 42 years later, actually. Uh, it's been a while. Well, Tom, start out with you by telling us how you got involved with the, with the space program and how did how this any boy going at this union done? in mission in the firing room for a historic mission like this. Okay, well, I, I was in the in an engineering science program at, at LSU, and uh, the, uh, one of the deans had proposed that uh, they might put together a uh, co-op plan where you work as a cooperative education student. And so he had solicited at KSC for people to go down there. And that sounds like something I would, I could really get into. So I, I did that. Um, went there, I was, uh, I reported for work on January 6th of 72. I have my dates all on. Uh, yeah, Dante, 1963, on January 6th, I showed up. And uh, the first the first day, they had somebody show me around a little bit. So one of the uh, draftsmen, they had draftsmen back then, took me out to uh, Pad 34, which was launching uh, Saturn 1. And they have a service structure that fits around the vehicle. So he said, let's go up to the top and I'll show you the cake. So we ride up the elevator and get to the top and it's set up so that you can show off the cake itself. And so we were out there and he told me which pads were which and uh, we talked and, okay, let's go back down. So we wait on the elevator. The elevator door opens and a dozen people get off or more. We get into the elevator and it goes down about three feet and stops. They had overweighted the they had overweighted the, the uh, they were 
it was the NASA people bringing somebody around uh, in a tour. So here I am in the elevator stop, and we wait for the uh, repair elevator guy to come. But, uh, so that was my introduction. To the I'll do a big start. Yeah. yeah. But you know, in those days, in the early 60s, I think, how many of you have been to the Space Center? I've been on one of the tours over there. Do you remember that in the 60s, you'd go on Sundays, it was open, they would give you a pass and a map, and you could drive around in there. My first recollection as a kid was we, we got, there were certain areas where you knew you couldn't go because there was generally a guy with a gun there or something. But we got to drive up around those, those paths and, and see a lot of that. And, it was, it was an exciting time. How, how exciting was it to work in that? I mean, what? I mean, that's got to be pretty cool to even, because everybody was into the space program. Well, I was the guy I was working for was his responsibility was put, putting the vehicles up, directing them on the path, mm -hmm. and so all that equipment uh, that was used to lift the vehicle. So we would check all that out and have it prepared and uh, and we had a, uh, a vehicle that would tow them and of course it had to be exercised so that got us to drive out the Cape Road right off the, right off the coast and I, I don't know if you know but a lot of that area people lived there and there were a number of houses um, right, basically on the beach, and that, all that got uh, taken uh, in a domain and folded into the center. But, so we would run up and down the road to exercise this equipment, and then maybe stop at a beach house and take a look at the ocean. But uh, since then, one of those houses was uh, taken over by the astronaut. Yeah, I was going to say, this is one of those, like the, the astronauts. The beach, it's called the beach house. The beach house, yeah. And uh, you can. As an employee, I would schedule a, a day that we, my kids would go over there and, and we'd have our lunch and so on. But, uh, shared with the astronaut quarters. Yeah, so, yeah because when, when they first started, it was really the Canaveral Air Force Station, but when the Space Center really took over, it took over a big chunk of Merritt Island. It was really right. Playing down. Well, what, uh, you know, in those early days, there, was, there were a lot of launch failures. I mean, we see those blooper reels. How how much of that kind of, of, of thing? I mean, it was a race, and you, had, you guys obviously were feeling some pressure. But what, what, what was the reality of that? Once the mandate, once Kennedy had made it clear we were going to the moon and everything was ramping up, how much of that pressure did you all really feel versus what we see in movies? Personally, I didn't feel it as pressure. It was a challenge. Yeah. That so, but we now we were working uh, three shifts a day, six, seven days a week, and uh, you know, so you're working twelve hours on, twelve hours off. But really, it's more than that because. When the, when the other shift comes in, you've got to brief them on wh where you are, and you know, and it's, so it's it made for long days, uh, and it, it got to be a grind. But everybody, we all knew what we were trying to do, and we were motivated. Now, in the early days. On occasion, after a second shift, I might go down to Cocoa Beach, and I could walk in the mousetrap at midnight and look around, and it looks like it might be 9 o'clock on Friday night. The, I don't remember the details as far as the, what the median age was at that time, but it was, it was fairly low, so you had people that were out yeah. To do good things. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, Cocoa Beach, Beach was a lot of fun. Even in the 70s, Cocoa Beach was a lot of fun in those days. Well, I wanted to share one about uh, uh, John Young. 
we were on the beach side. Now, you have to understand, before the, uh, the VAB was built, everything was on the beach side. And you had to come down to the port area. And when you came in to work, you had to show your badge. And when you left, you had to show your badge. So there was a guard there, and you put your badge up, and you laid it through. Well, I'm coming down that. I, I was a diligent employee. <laughs> I left late that evening, so it's about, about 5 o'clock. I'm coming south to the port. And the gate, you had to take a, a hard right to, to get to the gate. Well, as I'm getting to that curve, I look up, and there's somebody coming up on me pretty fast. And the uh, Air Force guys over there are really strict on the um, speed limit. So I looked, and I uh, then I let off a little bit. But no light or anything, so I said, I'll just wait till he hits his light. And so I turn to go to the, to the gate, and I'm slowing down. I look, and he's still coming pretty hard. And at that time, at 5 o'clock, there's only one lane out. So I get in that lane, the guard weighs me through, and he really didn't have me slow down like he normally would. But I pulled over, because I figured I'm going to get stopped. Well, I look as I pull over, and this Corvette goes flying by me. Now, I know that the guard didn't look at his back. <laughs> But uh, it was John Young, and, and uh, the, but those guys, they had the run of the place, well, and 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 they, I give them the due, they really did a heck of a job. So well, you know that there's an interesting story. Here's another good marketing tip. Jim Rathman Chevrolet over there right. in the Park County. Jim Rathman Chevrolet gave all the astronauts Corvettes to drive. And of course they had Jim Rath and Chevrolet tag on. And, and and he sold a lot of Corvettes because you wanted, if you were a young man, you wanted to have the same car that John Young had or Neil Armstrong, or Wally Shira. Uh Those guys, yeah, they, they were something. You were telling me about how uh, the astronauts were coming to even, even get down into the nitty gritty of the engineering. I mean, we think of them just as showing up to strap it and go, but they were they were working Right alongside of you all as well, well, my favorite story there is that uh, I mean, we had an uh, engine failure on uh, S2, and come to find out what happened was, I remember this right, uh, there, there's two lines that go up to the top of the engine to supply liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen for the start sequence. And they're small because you're only you're only using that to give you the propellants to do the start. Well in flight, one of them cut off and shut down. We come to find out what the suspicion was that was one of those ASI lines had broke. And suspicion was the hydrogen one because you're at minus 420, which is kind of severe on, on the things. Well, I did the test fire, and then they said, uh, that line looks solid. Now, it had a convolute, and I much thought this, yeah. well, these things were crazy. <coughs> What did I do with that? Is it in this box over here? Yes. Yeah. And I just haven't had a J2 engine. Uh, this way. Well, this, this, this will have to do. Uh, it's, it was similar to this. Similar to this in size, but it had convolutes so that it would give when you chilled it to the minus 420. And it would because at those temperatures, that thing is jumping around. Well, the suspicion was that that is what broke. But all the testing said no. Somebody said, let's put it in the altitude chamber. We put it in the altitude chamber. And as soon as that engine fired, it was walking all over the place. So uh, we ended up 
modifying the, the hardware. I was one of the younger guys, but I got to go to, to Mississippi, which I did want to explain some of that to you, uh, to do some test firing out there. The Apollo program did another great thing, and that is it brought the whole country together from the standpoint of we had centers in California, in Mississippi, in Texas, and here. So it had a lot of people involved. Well, Mississippi did the test firing. Now, why did we do that at the Cape? Well, you had to have another set of facilities. And one of the reasons is you couldn't fire these engines at sea level and have them run the same. The, the nozzle expansion uh, difference. So out there, they had that set up where they added to that nozzle so they could do the test firing at, 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 at sea level. So I went out there when they did, they brought the mod in, I participated with the guys when they did the modification out there. And then, uh, then we did the firing. But, uh, so we fast forward a couple months later, we're going to deliver an engine down here with that mod in it. We put it in. And I got a call that said, uh, I can't remember his name, uh, was coming down and they wanted me to go show them uh, how the mod was done. So I said, this is great because I've been involved in this from the get-go and I can explain them all to them. So we go out there and I start to explain it to them and end up, he tells me all about it. Well, this is one of the astronauts. This is, yeah. this is now he hadn't flown yet. This is one of the guys that had not flown. But he's telling me about all the mods. Now, what blew me away is this is not like shuttle. They had all that command module, service module, all that hardware to be concerned about. And he's explaining it to me. So the selection process was very extremely significant and it worked they did a great job yeah i, I put the j2 engine up here uh, on the thing what an incredible engine and the people i think don't realize the intricacies in rocket engines but uh, if, if there was one thing about rocket engines that i think probably the most misunderstood is that the complexity of the turbo pumps to get the fuel and oxygen okay. the wrench they're, they're as powerful they are themselves tremendously powerful engines so just the pumps that run the fuel in. I'm going to go back to a shot here. Um, let's see. Back to this shot. And so there, let's see, there you are right there, outside the firing room. And there were different contractors and different teams. There you go. Here. Um, here's the firing room. And they're still building at that time. This picture, I think, was in 1965, maybe. But so you work for... North American Aviation that became North American Rockwell, who was a contractor that NASA had what, Boeing, North American Rockwell. Oh, and North American also built this mm -hmm. stage as well as <coughs> IBM had the computers. And this again, like the like different six, uh, centers, the different aerospace companies came together on it. I think we got a shot here. Back up to that one June. Uh, Okay, just to, this was, uh, I worked on S second stage. Okay, here's the first stage over here, second stage, and McDonald Douglas was uh, behind us, and they had the third stage. So this was the, uh, the make up the firing. What I like is this, the woodshed. <laughs> so you get taken to the woodshed. <laughs> Rocco Patron. Uh, no, you didn't want to do that. Didn't want to go to the well, okay, I'll tell you the Rocco Patron uh, uh, story. Now, Rocco was a uh, Air Force Colonel, to my recollection, and also makes me think of uh, the Germans as far as he was very uh, determined. One of the guys I worked with was the supervisor for the ground support equipment. And they had 
problems with some of the regulators not holding up too well. So they go to a meeting, and he, and he starts out telling Rocco about how he went to the hardware store and bought a regulator and replaced the one that NASA had provided. Well, our boss was there, and he was not pleased. But it was true. So he didn't ever suffer any consequences, but it, as Rocco, that thing got fixed quick. Well, there's a similar story that I was told when, when they was trying to get STS-1, the first shuttle, I was on, and they were having some issues, and, and uh, the story I'm told is not apocryphal, that a couple of guys went to the Home Depot over in Titusville and got some uh, silicone sealant that they used to, uh, help with some of the waterproofing, shall we say. And was not mill spec, you know. But they needed it and they couldn't wait for it to come in. So. Well, they, uh, the tile issue was a big deal. And they were working uh, three shifts a day and uh, it was, they finally resolved, this is something I just learned a few weeks ago because we have our once a month uh, retiree lunch thing and so I sat with the guy that uh, had been involved in. They were, after they put the tile in, they would take a profile and you only allowed so much increase in height as you transition across that field. And so they would put the tile in and then they'd go do this profile and find out you got to take a tile out. And that rework was just unbelievable. Uh, time consuming. So they finally got to a system where they were able to do this profile five at a time, and it allowed them to turn that around. Yeah, the shuttle, you know, it, it was originally scheduled to fly in late 78 or 79, and then pushed back to 80 and finally 81. And I have an interesting recollection. I was working at Disney. In fact, of all places, honest to God, it was at Space Mountain. Um, I was the Tomorrowland Ops Supervisor of Space Mountain. And we had been told, because I had the Ops briefing sheet, that NASA had not notified Disney that when they were bringing the shuttle to the cave, this was being delivered from, from California, that they were going to fly it on the back of the 727 and do one orbit around Disney so that the people that paid for it could see it. And if you've ever seen how big a 747 is at low altitude, that's impressive in and of itself. I mean, and I thought, well, they got to be at, at, at three or 4,000 feet. As a pilot myself, I expected they would follow that um, protocol. So imagine my surprise when I see this thing coming in at, at about 1,500 or 2,000 feet. They wanted to give us a good look at it with a shuttle on top. And it's and not they, flying that fast either. And the no, and they crank it over so we can get a good look at the shuttle. <laughs> People just stopped and just in awe. It was an impressive thing. But the shuttle looked like hard and fresh, looked like hell. And all these dummy yeah, tiles, it looked, right. like, it looked like it, it had kind of suffered some, uh, you know, tile losses even coming from California. But there was a lot of fear uh, on those tiles. The very first flight, I remember, they were so worried that they might lose tiles. I have this, this picture up. I did your, there's your jacket up there, I think. Let's see, again, here. Is that you? Yes. Yeah, this, so there you are. And you got your North American jacket on. The different contact is that another I think a lot of questions I've heard from younger people I've heard from my own son is, my goodness, how did you do what you did with all of that old technology? Um, that's sort of like I hear about how did you get how did you ever get by with all those old cars back in the day? I mean, well they weren't old when we bought them. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell this one. This was this is uh, SDS eleven. I was a new kid on the block, so I'm the console I'm at is is uh, supporting the guy next to, uh, guy next to me. He's the chief for our three consoles there for the main propulsion. Well, 
on STS 14, or Apollo 14 rather. My boss said, you're up for the console chief for 14. That's great. Well, then Apollo 13 happened. They said, no new people for 14. Can't, there's too much risk. Well, my boss said, this guy's ready. He's ready. <laughs> all right. All right. We don't like it. But all right. So 14 comes. We get down and we're going to load the uh, the uh, start bottles have a small helium tank and around it is a larger tank that gets filled with gaseous hydrogen at a cold temperature. Now, if I remember, I liquid the hydrogen is minus 423. So we're, we're down at the 400, uh, minus 400 degrees. We, we pressurize, and I don't remember the times, I'm sorry, the last 50 years of affecting the call. But we did that down around eight minutes. And we bring up the pressure, and at that cold temp, we've already calculated how much pressure change is going to be for a liftoff. And of course, it's not until S S2 start so there's time built in for the long for the uh, ascent but all that's figured out well the test conductor was also aware that 13 had happened and that he better not mess up in 14. but they didn't explain to him that we were one of the critical things that we needed to be aware of he's looking at the weather and we Cloud cover moved in, we called a hold after we pressurized. Well, the guy next to me uh, in this one, this time is in the back of the firing room at the strip charts. And the other, another guy in the office. So the two of them are back there on the strip charts. The meters that I had to read that pressure, and this is this is you know, some years ago, it's about this big with no kind of granularity. So it's an indicator only. And we have this start box that we're in. It's reading temperature and pressure. And I come in at the bottom for I'm doing this right at the bottom here, low temperature, lower pressure. And it's gonna as over time, temperature and pressure are gonna walk this start off. Well, if it starts warming up, I have an option to bend that bottle. Reduce the pressure. What happens when I reduce the pressure? Your temperature is going to drop. So I'm walking across this box. Pressure and temperature increasing, bent. Down, up, down, up. And I'm walking across the box only because these two guys are back there because I got five engines. Now to, to make things a little bit more complicated, I can only vent two at a time. The ground support, the ground support equipment wouldn't handle the flow rate. So whoever, nobody ever thought this would happen. So, those two guys walked me across that start box. And I, I don't ever recall in my life ever being so totally focused. Uh, doesn't show in, in this one, but uh, one of the NASA guys that I had worked with when I was a co-op and knew well was sitting behind me. And he reminds me, every time I see him, he reminds me of that day. But, uh, so, if you can get a job where you 
have the kind of support that I had that day, it really builds sure. relationships. Yeah, I mean that's that's kind of the thing when you take a look at the the, the age. I mean, I, I mentioned this to you. I think in one of the emails I sent that you look at SpaceX and uh, where they are today. It looks a lot like uh, where you guys were in the '60s. They've got a lot of young people in there. They've got some senior people that are mentors. They're building a team and they're keeping a team together, right. which uh, you know is kind of what uh, what happened through our program. That's a big concern now. Is it's been so long, the continuity of what's going to happen when we do restart with, S, with the new SLS, uh, you know, you, you guys are going to be a little hard to get a hold of, uh, you know, when you're, when you're doing the things that you do as a retired fellow. Okay, back two, to run the two, again. two guys that uh, had worked for me just went to work for ULA a couple of months ago, and that was their focus, is they, they have a senior group that's there now. And these two guys are supposed to go in and trying to capture that some of that knowledge yeah. base. Yeah, well, and that's it because as I, as I alluded to, and we'll talk about this in a, in a bit, I mean, the engine technology um, for the new SLS, the new Saturn, if you will, it's going to use space shuttle main engines, the, what is it, RS-25 engines. Um, the, the J2 engine in a modified form is going to probably be that. So the guys like you that worked on that knowledge is absolutely still vital to the operation of those engines. And if they don't capture that, Austin does his volunteer out of this Victory ship, which is a World War or a World War II a ship down in, in the port of Tampa. And they have to bring in retirees to explain how stuff on that ship works because. There's not a lot of people that have worked on a World War II ship. And we're only 15 years, really, less time with regard to this technology. So I'm glad to hear they're capturing that knowledge. Now one of, one of the uh, rocket line technicians that I worked with uh, went back to uh, University of Florida after uh, he'd been working there a while. And uh, I hired co-op to come in from the University of Florida and he knew Neil and he said they had these different study groups and he said you wanted to get into Neil's group because when you came you were going to get cover all the material now you better come prepared or you wouldn't be invited again. So, Neil, so Neil graduated went out to California for an interview with Rockham and they talked about the job and whatever and <coughs> The guy said, uh, uh, here's your offer. He pushed the paper across the desk and Neil looked at it and said, you don't understand. I took those engines apart and put them back together 50 times. I know them. He took the paper and pushed it back to the guy. You better do better. He went to work for Rocket Island and then went to SpaceX. Mm -hmm. sure. And uh, I saw him when this is okay. This is in the night in uh, 2013. Yeah, 2013. I talked to him. He, went, he was back at the Cape and working for uh, NASA under contract. But uh, he said that they would take those engines apart, and put them back together, and then test fire again, tear them up, and we're all So I think they've got that engine. Yeah, that's really something. What, what do you think, I mean, again, living right there, on, what do you think about SpaceX flying those South and boosters that, you know, it was only about 2009 or, or 10 that Musk first teased that, and United Launch Alliance and other, you know, legacy contractors said, oh, that's animation, anybody can get a, you know, somebody that's good with uh, with animation and show that. that That's 20 years from now if they ever pull it off. And three or four years later, they landed the first booster, and now they're consistently flying them back. Plus the, the technology on, on the on these new engines, these Raptor engines, which have the ability, if need be, to burn with the methane, which he's obviously looking ahead to, the, to Mars. And this guy's 
he, he's, and he's doing this without a lot of government subsidy. So what are your thoughts? And then Bezos, his rocket engine there is, looks like it's a state-of-the-art engine too. Uh, several months ago, it was the first time that I saw the Blue Origin building. And uh, they've, it's larger than the BAD. This, this is Amazon's uh, owner that's got his own space program. And, and so he's got a building on base. Uh, rocket, I mean, uh, sorry, NASA has got some property that they're leasing out to different companies. So NASA's, I think, treating your money correctly uh, and recapturing some of it with renting this stuff out. But, uh, they've got a heck of a building there. Uh, SpaceX has got the uh, Pad A yeah, so facility. The, the, the Apollo launch complex, 39, had two pads. So going out, the crawler way went out. And had two pads. So SpaceX is going to use one of them, or is using right. one of them, for the Falcon Heavy. And the SLS is going to go off of the other one. Uh, for Pad B. And it's just it's amazing to see, again, that picture. That picture is the picture I've got back here. Uh, yeah, so this is this is the real picture, but this one is the artist Brinley. It's the actual photograph they've just put the rocket into it. So there it is, the same pad that we launched the lunar missions and the shuttles off of uh, being used. For the we, I think we've got a pretty good return on our investment. Uh, VAB. When I when I was working uh, on this too, we we had an office on the. Uh, 15th floor and to get over to the cafeteria I had to go across the highway there was a, a catwalk. Path, catwalk and I would walk across there and look down and they would bring visitors in at the end of the VAB in a little caged area and I would look down at those people and I, they looked like ants and then I'd say I'm only halfway to this halfway up the building is huge. I never, I always turned down, I had a couple opportunities to go up on the, on the roof. And I always turned it down. I don't know why. When we were ending the, the, the program, I was able to get to the center director and they allowed me to have a technical interchange meeting, which is code for invite the old people back. <laughs> so I brought back, we had over a hundred show up for three days in the, uh, not in the, the next building open, it's a new building now. But, uh, so we- Order have, processing? Yeah. OBF? OBF, OBF2. Yeah. So I said, hey, it's a good idea. <coughs> Work something to go up to the roof. So it went up to the roof. I don't know why I ever turned it down before. You can see forever. They have some meteorological uh, equipment on top of the roof. Makes sense. And they're up on a, uh, a platform. Everybody that went had to go up the extra 10 feet to get 10 feet high. <laughs> you can never get enough. Anyways, it, it, it was a beautiful day. and. Well, I think it's a good opportunity now to see if there's some questions that you all might have. Uh, yes, sir. Did you ever experience any of the weather inside that building that you hear about? You hear about that there's, yeah. there's clouds that form in the... I've never, uh, I've never seen that. Never. Now, like I say, I've only been up, you know, generally just halfway. But I know that was... It, a, it rains in our science, science building. But I think that's from a different <laughs> <lead>. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, were, they say that the, the height of it and the, the right. humidity in, in Florida and stuff that, you, that there actually forms clouds at times. So I don't know if that was tangible or I can't testify to that. Other questions or thoughts? Tom, what about <coughs> the space shuttle? Uh, you know, we focus because of the anniversary, we've been focusing on the uh, Apollo. But the space shuttle program, when you returned and went back to uh, 
to work um, at the K and your involved in the spatial program. Of course, as we saw in the, in the historical presentation, uh, you know, everybody remembers where they were on the day that the, uh, the challenger uh, was lost. Can you share a little bit about your experience on that day and what, what followed? <coughs> Okay, I was in the uh, fire room and uh, I was the lead that day for the council and the council that I'm at is we're looking at all the engine data and so I'm just I'm watching the data we and it it's set up so that if it goes out, if a measurement goes out it, that will turn red. So it, it's talking to me, not only just the numbers, but the display is talking to me. And everything is fine. My NASA guy was standing behind me, tapping on the shoulder. And so I turned and he said, he's pointed up. And so I looked out the window and uh, I just, I could just see some smoke. I didn't really see anything. So I looked back at the console and the data was still there, but I had an ability to hit a button and bring back the previous three minutes would come back and, and display. Never used that before. I don't know what, what they had in mind when they did that, but uh, anyways, I thought that was a good feature. So I hit the button. As soon as I did, they had already locked it up. They had a procedure that if anything went off, went bad, they lock everything up. All the consoles are locked, so you can't do anything. To this day, I do not know how long we were in that room. Time didn't have any meaning. We bring a lot of reference material with us, and that's sitting behind me. All that had to be left. Nobody left with any material. Now there's 300 people in that room, and you, you could hear it then. Uh, it was everybody was just devastated. Uh, we had the right crew at that time. Krista McCall was a super uh, advocate that that was selling the NASA program for, so we, we were one with her, you know. Uh, I don't know how long I was there. I think it was about six, eight weeks I got my reference material back. What my boss had me do that for that was because we, it was right here, the Navy was able to bring a lot of that material back and uh, given the altitude and whatever, it was, a, lot of, a lot of it was fairly intact. So my job was to go through our, what, what was our equipment, identify what was ours, and document what parts and, you know, uh, left and right and to, come up with so we have to get down the serial numbers to document which is which. And then after we got everything identified, then it was decided they were going to put all of this in a uh, you knew them over yeah, the uh, nine uh, the, the uh, men, they had a minute man missile silo, silo the testing but it wasn't used anymore you said it's a tomb really. and, and uh, they were smart. Whatever went over there got all cut up so that nobody could say, I've got these. So that, uh, which then brings us to Columbia. Uh, okay, that, that day, it was a Sunday morning. I was at home. And one of my guys was on console because as part of re-entry, they repressurized the manifold so that you don't get any, you don't, Bring any air into the manifold because we don't we don't like air. So he's there to monitor for the reentry because we pressurize and we document. So I call him 
we were in the blackout period. And, uh, so I said, Mike, uh, uh, we got data back yet? And he said, no. I said, well, see, he didn't, I, actually, I knew more than he did, because uh, he's just on the console and, uh, you know, watching for data. And I said, well, I don't think you're going to get back. So, uh, so subsequently, I sent people out to Texas, and they literally walked the field, and they brought, the, the smart thing they did was they brought a lot of uh, forest fires, forest fighters, forest fire eaters in from the west to, into Texas. And they, my guys walked with them. They armed, they shoulder to shoulder walk and find hardware. They came upon a big hole in the ground, about 12 feet deep. And I said, that's one of the engines. So they went and then finally did a couple days and got, got it out. Well, it wasn't an engine. It was just the top of the pump. So that's was the kind of force that that boy oh, yeah. was coming in. Uh, uh, so the uh, the facility was just off the runway. They had the hangar there. Mm -hmm. Everything was taken there and set up uh, like they would for a uh, airline mm -hmm. crash. And all the data, I mean, all the hardware was set out. And one of the guys that uh, the new the technicians told me about, uh, they brought in the landing gear. And brought in on a truck, and this is weeks later. So he's out there to help them offload it. And he said, that ain't ours. He said, I don't know where you got that, but that came off of something else. That's not ours. And they said, they're saying that that's the landing gear. He said, now this landing gear is huge. And he said, I've worked on it for 10 years. I would recognize it. But that's the forces in the, in the, uh, the heat, because all the, the bracketry that was on it to hold telemetry had all been burned away. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the forces coming in, the heat had to be just labor. Uh, they, but there was other stuff that would come in and... Yeah, pay, there were papers and things that were intact. It decelerated so fast that we just walked it down. Well, one, uh, one of the, the guys that went out from my office, they found that the instrumentation container that looked like it had been dropped off the back of a pickup truck. The whole corner was bent. And what was significant there is it had data that was recorded in flight that was not telemetry back. So it was another resource that they had to evaluate. So that was a fortunate find. Well, the other thing I think was Columbia had that vestige of being the first show of so instrumented. It still had all the instruments that they put in for the flight development. It helped them investigate that so, to a greater degree than right. it's been one of the later shows. I remember that morning well because we were expecting sonic booms and uh, my wife and, and my mother-in-law, who was down at the time of visiting, were watching. And how many of you remember Yolanda Fernandez? She actually works for the Sheriff's Department now as a spokesperson. She was the Sunday morning news woman. And uh, I was waiting for the sonic booms. I knew about where in the flight re-entry we would hear them. Um, and I poked my head back in, and, and Donna said, there's something wrong. And I said, what? She said, the Yolanda Fernandez just came on and said, the, the shuttle's overdue. And I looked at her and I said, the shuttle's never overdue. I said, the energy management on that, they know where it is down to, you know, a few hundred meters at any given time. I said, that's bad. And then we watched, and of course you could tell that she was hearing something in her earpiece. And I said, this isn't good. I said, this is something bad. I said, something bad has happened. I said, and then when the time came for the touchdown and it wasn't there, well, it doesn't take a lot to figure out something. 
around that same time they were seeing debris, what looked like a meteor storm over Texas. Well, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, what a, what a, a, a tragedy that was. Again, people think going back to capsules is a step backward, but the ability to survive a sick accidents is so much greater. And for that matter, even a re reentry, you know, the fail-safe mode of capsules is ballistic reentry. So there's a lot of great, a lot greater safety in, in doing it the old way. The irony, I think, is we've we'll, we'll, we'll kind of gone back to realizing that. Are there any other questions? Uh, I want to, yeah. I'm just curious, what, was it the um, tiles that came off and the heat got inside when they broke through? The, the, the carbon, carbon, the carbon, carbon on the front of the wing was, was which is a, a heat resist material, mm -hmm. was broken by a falling chunk of ice. Oh. It left a gash that was only about that big, about that long, but the plasma, the superheated gas on the entry, got in that crack. Mm -hmm. The shuttle's highly insulated from the outside, but when the hot gas got on the inside, it's all just aircraft quality aluminum and it started to damage things. One of the engineers knew when they suspected there could have been a problem after takeoff, which they did not inform the astronauts of, he took it upon himself to kind of go through and figure out what, scenario, what a failure scenario would look like. And he figured that certain things would happen and certain sensors would activate and the tire would probably over overpressurize. And he said, this is the sequence. And he shared it with one of his friends and when that started happening, they had the first hint that bad things were coming. But the old Columbia, to her credit, her onboard flight computers compensated, went to the full stops to keep it, because the wing was literally coming apart. Mm -hmm. And when it reached a certain point, it went into a flat spin. Mm -hmm. And that was all she wrote. You can't recover from that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Do we need to have a moon base before we try to go to Mars, or can we go straight to Mars and go forward? I don't know. That that's it's not resolved. There there were there were what three different three different proposals to get to the moon. There was a direct ascent. There was an Earth orbit rendezvous and a lunar orbit rendezvous, rendezvous plan. And any of them would have worked. They just had different engineering challenges. There's no reason to have a moon base to go to Mars except to perhaps build more experience. Some people would say to actually stall for time. And we, we could fly to Mars with the technology we have now. The problem with Mars is it's a lot further away than the moon. By the time you get there. Yeah. yeah. And if you have problems, you ain't coming back in three days. Uh, and there are other challenges uh, that we don't even know of. Some of those challenges might be able to be explored or modeled on the moon, but the moon and, the, and Mars are two different worlds. So many things that, that Mars will present as challenges are unique, are unique to Mars. Um, like taking off? Yeah, Mars has more gravity <coughs> than the moon, less than the Earth. Mars has an atmosphere, so there's a reentry issue on Mars, so there isn't on the moon. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of challenges. I, I think that. Probably the simple answer is, it's not necessary. Will it be part of the plan? It looks like it, it, it will be. I think that that's what we're hearing now. We're going to go back to the moon. I think from a political standpoint, it also provides a goal that's achievable in a, in a, in a shorter term. Well, and also, if it, it proves correct that there is ice, water, whatever, there's, there's the oxygen and hydrogen there that you could fuel on. Right, and you mm -hmm. right. take off from there and create a lot of sleep. And there's, there's some, some truth to that. I think the bigger benefit there is learning how to use on the planet resources uh, in a real situation would be a good driver. For us. What he's speaking of is what we didn't know when we went to the moon the first time is that in those craters in the lunar polar regions, we now verify that there is water ice. Uh, down in those craters. The moon is inherently dry, but common impacts have deposited water ice in places where it hasn't sublimated back into vapor. And 
you break water down, you get hydrogen and oxygen, and uh, you got rocket fuel and something to breathe and something to drink. And you're good to go. Well, when I read, there's also some issues with genetic changes that happen to the human body when you have long-term space travel, and that's happened to some of the astronauts that have been up for over 100 days, 200 days, and some serious issues that they faced in coming back. And that's an interesting thing because, again, when you're outside the Earth's magnetic field and atmosphere, the protection it offers from cosmic radiation is gone. And there's a trade-off, an engineering trade-off. How much weight can you afford for shielding? How much protection can you afford to provide the astronauts? And so think about it if we talk about a long-term presence, because it's a cumulative dose. It's like going to a nuclear power plant. If you visit a power plant, hey, that's not as bad as getting an x-ray at the dentist's office. If you work there, it's a different story, right? right. That's a good, good point. And airline pilots. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. other, uh, other questions or before we wrap up today? No other questions? Well, please, uh, again, uh, express your thanks for Donald for coming here. I'm sure he's not going to bolt out of the room. If you have a question or do you want to come and ask him as we're leaving, I'm sure he'll take time. And, and got I've, got a, I've got a few pieces show. of equipment, not terribly interesting. But. <laughs> and thank you all for coming out today. <laughs>